All right, and we have finally come to linear regression part three, the last video in the series. Hopefully you watched part one. Hopefully you watched part two. Let's do a quick recap. First off, linear regression is all about fitting a model to our data. And the equation for that is y hat, or the predicted y equals a plus bx. We also have r, which is important we talked about. That's correlation correlation. It's called the correlation coefficient. We also have R squared, which is called the coefficient of determination. So pretty important there. Okay, so remember we need to be able to identify these values. We need to be able to interpret them in context. We need to be able to predict with our equation, being able to plug in an X and get a predicted Y. We need to be able to determine is a linear model appropriate and is a linear model reliable. So um, to understand the interpretations of y-intercept slope and r-squared, I kind of wrote some scripts here. And if we follow the scripts, um, a lot of kids have struggles, ex kids struggle kind of explaining these things. So if we follow the script, you can pretty much always get it right. So first off, the y-intercept is when the x variable is 0, we predict the y variable to be, and then you give that answer. Just make sure you give units. So again, you just fill in the blanks. You fill in the x variable, and you fill in the y variable with the actual variable from your problem. So you say, you know, for example, when the mileage of the car is 0, we predict the um, sale price to be $20,000, whatever it is. Slope um, is for every one x variable that is added, the predicted y variable increases or decreases if it's negative by the actual slope. Just don't forget units, and the unit for slope is the same unit as the y variable. So for every one mile that is added to the car, the predicted price of the car decreases by 16 cents. So pretty easy there as well. Just follow the script. R squared, remember R squared is the percent of the variation in the Y variable that is explained by the variation in the X variable. So we'd say, you know, for example, 90% of the variation in the price of the car is explained by the variation in the mileage of the car. Um, another way of saying that is 90% of the variation in the price of the car is explained by the linear model that uses uh, mileage to predict price. So um, again, if you write down these scripts and just kind of fill in the blanks, it's really hard to mess them up. All right, one more really important value that we're going to learn in this is a new measurement called S. Now, we did learn that S is the standard deviation. So good news is that's still holding true. But what is S when you're referencing a linear model? Well, S is the standard deviation of the residuals. Okay, first off, the formula for this is a little bit ugly. Don't worry about it. You will always be given the value of S in that computer output that we talked about in class. Once again, S is the standard deviation of the residuals. Now, if you remember, what does standard deviation mean in normal terms? But we've used it before. Standard deviation is how far a typical value is from the mean. So in terms of a linear model, the standard deviation tells us how far a typical distance is from the regression line. So remember, a residual is how far your actual point is from the line. So the standard deviation of the residuals tells us the typical distance that a point is from the regression line. So a scatter plot like this one right here is going to have an S value that's pretty low because most of the points are near the line. So typically points are near the line. So this would maybe have an S value. Let's just say that it has an S value of 0.5. It means that typical points are 0.5 units from the line. Could be above, could be below, but typically they are 0.5 units from the line. Those units are the same units as your Y variable. This graph right here is going to have an S value that's a little bit higher because look at the dots. Most of the dots are far from the line. Yes, there's a couple here and here that are near the line, but overall uh, there's a lot of scatter, so most points far, far from the line. So here we're going to have an S value. Maybe the S value here would be 3, and we would say that typically a value is 3 units from the line. So um, it tells us kind of tells us about how reliable that line is, right? I mean, a, a line like this one over here in this first graph, this is a really good line. It really models the data well because the S value is so small, because most points fall near the line. When your S value is a little bit higher, you might not be as reliable. Your model might not model the data very well. So just understand that S is the standard deviation of the residuals, and it tells you how far a typical point is from the regression line.
All right, let's take a look at an example here. This is data collected from the SEC Football Conference, and they looked at, at the end of the year, how many points did each team score per game and how many wins they had. Looking at that scatter plot, it appears that you scored more points per game than you did have more wins. Okay, so the first question I could ask you is, South Carolina scored 30.1 points and had 11 wins. Find the residual. Well, let's see here. They actually had 11 wins. That was what actually happened. Their residual is how far away our prediction is from that. So to get our prediction, we're going to use the equation. So we're going to take negative 3.75. We're going to add 0.437 times the 30.1 because x is the points per game. So I'm going to plug that in. And we predicted for them our predicted value for South Carolina using the equation was 9.4037. So now we're going to take the actual number of wins 11, subtract away the predicted for 9.4037. So 11 minus that gives us a residual of 1.5963. So this is going to be a positive residual of 1.5963. So it means South Carolina was 1.5963 wins above what was predicted. Above what was predicted. Um, so I got to assume that this right here is probably South Carolina right here. Again, so this distance right here, here was 11 right here. Oh, that was the actual value. The predicted value right here was at about 9.4037. So that's a distance of positive 1.5963. Is a linear model appropriate for this data? Well, this is, should be an easy question to answer for two reasons. One, the scatter plot does appear to be linear. That's pretty nice. And two, the residual plot shows no pattern. Um, we love no pattern in the residual plot. So this tells me that there were positive and negative residuals in the beginning, positive and negative residuals in the middle, positive and negative residuals at the end. Some residuals were small, some residuals were big, showing that our line went right through the data very well. Okay, interpret the value for S. So the S value is 1.24. So I wanted to make this real nice and neat, so I wrote this out for you, actually. So what does the S value of 1.24 mean? So it says, when using the least squares regression line with the points per game used to predict wins, the model is typically off by about 1.24 wins. Remember, S measures how far a typical point is from the line. So our S value says that our model is usually off by 1.24 wins. Again, it's measuring the same thing as the Y variable. So typically, we're off by about 1.24 wins. Is that good? Is that bad? I guess it all depends what you're using the data for. In some aspects, with only 12 um, to 13 games played a year, that's kind of off by quite a bit. It all depends on your data. You could also look at that scatter plot and say, well, you know, some points are really close to it, but there's a couple that are further away. But overall, I don't think that's a huge S value. If you look at the scatter plot, you get a clear picture that most points are near the line. Finally, interpret R squared. Well, 88% of the variation in wins, that's the Y variable, is explained by the linear model relating wins to points per game. So notice how it's, it's the percentage of the variation in the Y variable. So 88% of the variation in wins is explained by the linear model relating wins to points per game. There is another way you can mention this. You could say 88% of the variation in wins is explained by the variation in points per game. You can give either one. Just use the script that I gave you. All right, moving on to the next topic for this video is why is it called a regression line? I briefly touched on this in the last video, but I really want to make sure this is nice and clear. Why do we call it a regression line? So first off, it is officially called a least squares regression line. So the LS stands for least squares. That is because we want the sum of the square residuals to be as small as possible, meaning that our line goes through the data really nicely. But where does it get the term regression line? Well, it comes actually from the formula for slope. First off, Remember, r can be made a fraction by saying r over 1. Now, this formula tells me that every time I go up one standard deviation in x, so if I go up one standard deviation in x, I go up r standard deviations in y. But what you need to realize is that r is always going to be a little bit less than 1. It's never a perfect relationship. So even if r is like, say, 0.98, it's a pretty strong relationship, but still not perfect, that means every time I go up one standard deviation in x, here comes y, y goes up 
0.98 standard deviations in the Y, which means that the Y is always regressing or lagging behind the X. And that's where it gets the term regression line from. So once again, if I happen to go up two standard deviations in X, so one, two standard deviations in X, then the Y goes up 2R. Well, 2R would be 2 times 0.98, again, 1.96. So there was the two standard deviations in X, but here comes up, here comes Y. It goes up 1, which is 0.98, goes up another, another 0.98, so it's starting to regress even further behind. So now R, I'm sorry, X went up two standard deviations, where Y only went up 1.96. And obviously, if R is less than 0.98, like let's say we have an R of 0.6, zero, then we're going to even regress further behind. So that's where it gets the term regression line from. So keep that in mind. So there is a connection between the standard deviations for the X and the Y and R. Every time you go up one standard deviation in X, you go up R standard deviations in Y or down if you're negative. You could have a negative slope, obviously. Okay, outliers. Now, we've kind of talked and him honed around outliers, but I want to make a couple clear comments about outliers now. First off, outliers are points that don't fit the overall pattern. These are points that are outliers in the Y direction, and they usually have large residuals. Other outliers, though, may not have large residuals. So, for example, I gave you two little pictures here. This first one here, if we think about a regression line, right? Here's my regression line going through my data, okay? This point right here, this turquoise point right here, is definitely an outlier in the Y direction, right? Um, in terms of the X values, it's actually right in the middle. I mean, here's our lowest X, and here's our highest X, and it's actually right in the middle. But in terms of the Ys, it's definitely an outlier. And that point is obviously going to have a very, very large residual, very, very large negative residual. Okay, now what does that type of point do to my line? Well, to be honest, not a whole lot. It does probably change my y-intercept a little bit because the whole line has to adjust for that. Because remember, that line wants to have the residuals be as small as possible. So it's going to try to have to move down, but if it moves down too far, then it's going to make all the other points have large residuals. So it's not going to move down too much. If anything, it'll change the y-intercept a little bit, but it's just one point, and because it's in the middle of your x values, it doesn't make a huge impact on the graph. But nevertheless, it's still an outlier. Now, here's an outlier right here. This guy's an outlier in both the X and the Y direction. So remember, my X's are from here to here. Here's my smallest X. Here's my largest X. Well, that is definitely an outlier. Here's my largest Y. Here's my smallest Y. Again, definitely an outlier. But this point actually does nothing because if here is my line, here's my linear line, if I were to add that point, all it does is extend my line and it actually has a small residual. Okay, so that is a point that, again, isn't really going to change your line very much. With or without that point, the line is still pretty much the same slope and the same y-intercept. If anything, all that point does is it extends the pattern, making r squared stronger. So it's going to make your relationship look stronger, but it's not going to really change your slope or y-intercept at all. It's definitely an outlier, but since it fits the pattern, it doesn't really change the equation. So this brings us to a very specific type of point called an influential point. An influential point is a point that is an outlier, okay? So we're still talking about an outlier here, but it's a very specific type of outlier. It's an outlier that if you were to remove it, it would make a significant, and that's an important word there, a significant, not just a little change, but a significant change to the slope of the regression line. Now, I made a picture with an outlier that's considered influential right here. So there's my influential point right there. This is definitely an influential point. Here's a couple reasons why. One is it's an outlier in the x, x direction, not the y. So here's my smallest x, here's my largest x, and it's, you know, in terms of um, y's, it's not an outlier at all. I mean, here's my smallest y, here's my largest y, it's right in the middle. But it is an outlier in the x. It's definitely bigger than my biggest x. Okay, so that's one indication. Now, the other thing is, it's so influential, it oftentimes has a small residual. Meaning, if I were to forget that turquoise point for a second, here would be my line. Beautiful line going right through the data, trying to keep all those residuals as small as possible. But if I were to add that line, my, or if I were to add that point, excuse me, my line might do something like this. Because what it's going to try to do is it's try to, going to try to keep everybody happy. So we call this point a high leverage point. 
Okay, it has a lot of leverage because what it's going to do is that so much leverage it can actually pull the line towards it. And when you pull the line towards it, it now looks like it has a small residual. So this line right here, it's trying to keep all the other residuals small and it's trying to keep this residual small and that's why it influences it so much and it makes the slope make a major change. I mean, the difference between these two green lines is pretty significant in terms of the slope. So an influential point is a point that if you were to remove it, your slope changes significantly. And the indication that you have an influential point is that it's an outlier in the x direction, not necessarily the y. That's the indication of an influential point. And there are oftentimes they're so influential that they actually pull the line towards them, making it look like they have a small residual. So like I said, this point right here looks like it has a very small residual, but that's because it was so influential to pull the line towards it. Remove that point, and we get this line right here, which is a completely different line. So make sure you understand the difference between points like down here. These two graphs, we had points that were outliers, but they really didn't make a huge major change to our slope. Maybe small changes, but nothing significant. Here, we have an influential point that makes a significant change to our slope. Okay, I got a last few comments. This is a little bit of a shorter video, so last few comments I want to make here. Um, first is that the distinction between the explanatory and the response variable is really important. In fact, if you switch those variables around, you're going to get a whole new equation. Remember that your slope is built from taking r times the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. So you better believe that whose y and whose x matters. Same thing for the um, y-intercept. It's the average y minus the slope times the average x. So if you switch around those x's and y's, you're going to get a completely different line. So who's the explanatory, whose response really matters? So this is why we talk about the fact that a linear regression line is meant to take an x and predict a y, not go the other way around. If you want to go the other way around, so you would really have to redo the entire formula. So if you're going to switch who's x and who's y, you're going to be flip-flopping these things, you're going to be changing your means, so you get a whole new formula. So it really does matter. Correlation or regression lines describe only linear relationships. Never use the word correlation, never use the correlation value unless you know that your data is somewhat straight. Never use a straight regression line if your data is curved. We've talked about that in class as well. Um, correlation and least squares regression line are not resistant. This is what we just got done talking about outliers and influential points. Influential points certainly can change the slope of a regression line, and outliers could definitely affect your R value. So keep that in mind. They're not resistant to outliers. They definitely get affected. Lastly, association or correlation do not imply causation. So we might find that we have some strong relationships and some really good prediction models, but at the end of the day, there's no way we could say that the explanatory variable causes the response variable. It takes an awful lot to do that, which we'll learn about in later units, to be honest. But do not, um, do not think that association or strong correlation means causation. All right, guys, that's it for linear regression. We'll talk more in class.